under better uh, circumstances. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to touch on various different topics related to HIV latency. Um, but first of all, to, to put the problem in context, um, in uh, 2019, approximately 38 million people globally were living with HIV, and a further 32 million people had died from age-related illnesses since the start of the epidemic. Uh, so really, in a, a triumph of modern medicine, we now have available uh, potent antiretroviral therapies. Uh, so these, these are combinations of drugs that can be taken every day that suppress um, HIV from replicating. Um, and uh, they can therefore prevent disease progression. But these therapies are not perfect. Um, so they're associated with the development of virologic drug resistance. Um, the patients have to take them every day for life, and so they experience treatment fatigue. Uh, these drugs have side effects. Uh, they require a sophisticated medical infrastructure to deliver the drugs and to monitor their efficacy over time and um, you know, show that resistance is not developing. Uh, they don't eliminate all the negative side effects associated with HIV, including, for example, ongoing immune activation. And perhaps most importantly, they don't cure the infection. And over 10 million HIV-infected individuals worldwide do not have access to these life-saving therapies. So there really is a pressing need to develop a cure for HIV, to eliminate the virus altogether from infected individuals, to, to stop disease progression, and also to stop them from, from further transmitting the virus. And so my lab is interested in studying this question in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, we use small animal models, as Eric mentioned, uh, to study where HIV is hiding during therapy. Um, and then we're also trying to develop methods to um, specifically and efficiently eliminate the um, residual virus that's left over during therapy, these viral reservoirs. And so the natural course of HIV infection is associated with a high level of virus replication. So there are billions of new infected cells and free virus particles produced and cleared every day in each infected person. Um, if that person starts taking antiretroviral therapy or ART, then the vast majority of this replication can be stopped. Um, so some investigators believe all HIV replication in the body is stopped by these potent drugs. But the virus persists because of the presence of these long-lived reservoir cells shown here in red. And what that means is if the person stops taking therapy, um, even you know, years or over a decade after starting, the virus can emerge from these reservoirs and replicate to high levels again. And so you have continued disease progression. So there's obviously been a huge amount of, of interest in developing a better understanding of what these reservoir cells are and how can they, be, like, how can they maintain infection over these long periods of time. And so the most well-defined and probably the largest reservoir is within latently infected CD4 positive T lymphocytes. So these are rare cells in vivo, around one per million total resting CD4 cells is latently infected, and they probably constitute around 100,000 to a million cells per patient. Um, so this is a minimal estimate based on a single round of ex vivo stimulation. Uh, regardless, um, they have a long half-life of over 40 months, which is um, sufficient to maintain the infection for life, even if there were no further replication of virus or expansion of the reservoir. Um, so they're highly clinically relevant, both as a barrier to eradication of the virus, um, so they, they prevent cure of the infection, and as a repository of archival HIV sequences. Um, so for example, drug-resistant variants can, um, can be deposited in the reservoir uh, early in infection and limit treatment options later on. And so in terms of how latency is actually formed, this is the HIV life cycle. So the virus binds to its receptors, CD4 and a co-receptor, which is typically CCR5 or CXCR4. It then undergoes fusion and uncoding, and then it converts its um, single-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA through reverse transcription. The double-stranded DNA genome then um, translocates into the nucleus and integrates. So it becomes a permanent part of the host cell's chromosomes. And from there, it acts very much like a cellular gene. So you have um, RNA transcription, uh, you have splicing, nuclear export, translation, assembly, budding, and then finally, uh, maturation. And so what happens in the course of latency is HIV makes its way through um, the first half of this life cycle through integration, and then it stops. And so it stops in this, kind of, in this latent state where it's still it's part of the host cell's DNA, um, but it, it's expressing little or no viral proteins um, a no viral RNA. Um, so it's essentially invisible to the host immune response because it's not expressing viral proteins. And here I've underlined the stages of the HIV life cycle that are targets of currently available antiretroviral drugs, so FDA approved drugs. And none of them affect an integrated provirus that is not expressing. So it's outside the reach of current therapies as well. 
Those drugs can stop the virus from replicating, but they can't affect this latent reservoir. And so part of the reason that the latency forms is um, a, essentially a byproduct of the cell types that HIV infects in vivo. So HIV infects CD4 positive T cells, and these cells can exist in um, essentially two basic states. They can be in a resting state where they're waiting to see their cognate antigen, and so they're not very metabolically active. And these resting CD4 cells are generally refractory to HIV infection. So there's multiple blocks to infection that prevent HIV from replicating well in these cells. Um, CD4 cells also can be in an activated state. Um, and so this is when they're very metabol metabolically active, they're producing cytokines, uh, and these are uh, preferred cell types uh, for HIV to replicate in. So it replicates very effectively. And the problem is that, that CD4 positive T cells can transition between these states. So if a virus um, infects a CD4 positive T cell that's activated, uh, but before the cell can be killed, either by viral cytopathic effects or immune effector mechanisms, that's, that cell transitions to a resting uh, CD4 positive T cell, a memory cell, then this is associated with a shutdown in cellular metabolic activity, and it kind of traps the HIV genome in this latent state. Um, and the other problem is that, that these cells are part of the, the cellular basis for immunological memory. So they're designed to persist over long periods of time. And so they can persist for decades without producing virus with this silent uh, viral cargo until the cell passes through a pro-inflammatory cytokine environment or it sees its cognate antigen and becomes activated. And this leads to activation of the host cell and concomitant production of infectious HIV. Um, so we throw these numbers around, you know, one in a million resting CD4 cells is latently infected. Um, but just to put that in context, um, you know, pre-COVID-19 pandemic, Fenway Park had a capacity of 37,731 people. And so uh, finding that one in a million uh, latently infected CD4 positive T cells is like finding one person in 27 full baseball stadiums. And everybody looks the same and you can't search anyone. And so in order to cure the infection, we would need to do this a million times because we have approximately a million uh, reservoir cells hidden in this way. Um, however, if you were to uh, make that person identify themselves, say light a flare, you may be able to um, identify them and find them amidst all those other cells. And so what we're trying to do with a, a kick and kill approach I'll, I'll describe later is trying to get the, um, those latently infected cells to show themselves. And so, um, so one uh, popular approach that's being actively explored in the field towards uh, latency reversal is um, a so-called kick and kill approach. Um, so the idea is to try and get rid of these latently infected cells. So if you imagine that this is a latently infected CD4 positive T cell, it's expressing little or no viral RNA, no viral proteins, uh, but if it could be induced to express uh, viral proteins or even whole HIV virions, then the cell would become uh, subject to viral cytopathic effects. So the act of producing virus can be toxic to cells. It also uh, becomes subject to immune surveillance. And so the cells can be killed by cytotoxic T lymphocytes or natural killer cells um, and can be targeted by anti-HIV uh, antibodies or immunotoxins. But this is all contingent on getting that cell to start expressing HIV proteins. And so for that, uh, the field has been searching for what we've uh, described as latency reversing agents or LRAs as depicted here by Mario. And uh, so ideally we would have something that specifically and efficiently induces expression of latent HIV and does very little else. And so this would be optimal stimulation. In practice, uh, most of the latency reversing agents that have been explored by the field um, suboptimally activate the cells. Okay, so you get a little bit of RNA expression, no viral proteins, and you don't engage these various kill mechanisms. The converse problem is if you overstimulate the cells, you have the opposite problem. So here you can overstimulate the immune system, cause generalized immune activation, hypercytokinemia, a cytokine storm, and you have a different collection of problems. And so finding the right balance here between, um, you know, like to, um, to engage in optimal stimulation has been a real challenge for the field. And so while we're searching for better LRAs, um, there is no optimal LRA that has been identified yet. So that's part of what we're searching for. Um, so this is the more technically correct version of that. On the left-hand side, we have a, a latently infected CD4 positive T cell, which we want to induce to become a productively infected CD4 positive T cell, which would lead to uh, production of, of HIV proteins, which are loaded into MHC class one, allowing the cell to be targeted by HIV specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, we have HIV envelope proteins being expressed on the surface, which can be targeted by um, either anti-HIV um, 
uh, antibodies or immunotoxins. Um, and then you have uh, virus budding and viral, production, viral protein production, which can be cytopathic for the cell. So all of this would be done in the presence of continued antiretroviral therapy. So heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy, or ART. And this prevents any newly produced virus from spreading, from uh, replicating in, in new target cells. And so various different pathways have been explored to try and um, induce HIV from latency. And so one pathway I'll talk about a lot today is a so-called protein kinase C or PKC pathway. So prostratin here is an example of a PKC modulator. And so these are small molecules that um, get into cells and they bind to protein kinase C. Um, they, they form a complex which translocates to intracellular membranes and activates downstream kinases, which results in activation of NF-kappa B, an important transcription factor for HIV expression. So you get, um, so these can uh, induce upregulation of HIV expression. And several different PKC modulators uh, that are naturally occurring have been explored by the field. Um, so one is bryostatin-1. It's been in over 40 completed clinical trials, uh, primarily in the cancer field, where it can affect uh, tumor growth and angiogenesis. Um, it's originally from uh, CMOS. And the second uh, is called prostratin. Um, so there's more limited clinical or preclinical data available for this, but uh, it's uh, from the uh, bark of the mammala tree in Samoa. And uh, traditional healers took the bark and, and make a tea with it. Um, so it was used to treat viral hepatitis and jaundice. And so each of these compounds can induce HIV from latency um, in essentially all, all model systems tested. So bryostatin-1 works at low nanomolar concentrations and prostratin works at low micromolar concentrations. But neither of them work perfectly. They didn't evolve to induce HIV from latency or to be non-toxic in mammalian systems. So we spent quite a lot of time trying to enhance the activity of these PKC modulators using different uh, mechanisms and pathways. And so I want to just touch on a few of those in my talk today. Um, so one is to simply improve the delivery of the, the natural products. Um, so if you can target them more specifically to the cell type of interest, in our case, CD4 positive cells, because that's the main receptor for HIV, um, and away from other cell types, then you could moderate, uh, you could uh, mediate a more specific and um, uh, response uh, and reduce off-target effects. And so we've done that in a couple of different ways by nanoparticle delivery, where we target nanoparticles using anti-CD4 antibodies, um, and also using these proteinaceous um, nanoparticles in collaboration with Lenny Wilms' lab at UCLA uh, that, that are termed vaults, where you can essentially engineer an amphipathic helix in the belly of the vault, uh, which takes up lipids, uh, which in turn absorbs hydrophobic molecules that can be um, enhanced delivery of, uh, of these compounds. So that's like one basic approach is to alter the delivery uh, of the compounds. A second is to uh, modify the molecules themselves. Um, and so uh, we don't have a complete understanding of the structure function relationships between these molecules and their downstream activities, but we do have a broad understanding. Um, so these upper portions of the molecules are associated with membrane interaction and downstream signaling. Um, so essentially the, the depth and orientation of the PKC, PKC modulator complex in the membrane affects the downstream signaling. Um, and the lower portions of the molecules, particularly these three oxygens that are highlighted, are responsible for direct binding of the PKC modulator to protein kinase C. Um, and so in order to uh, modify these molecules, we've had a long-standing collaboration with Paul Wender's lab at Stanford University. Um, so these are bioorganic chemists who have worked for many years on uh, designing and synthesizing new PKC modulators for uh, uh, cancer studies and Alzheimer's disease studies. And so we've been working with them to um, try and enhance uh, these PKC modulators for HIV latency reversal. And so there's various different reasons one would want to do this beyond like enhancing their activity. Um, so one is that the bryostatin one obtaining it for like the clinical trials that I discussed uh, is very problematic. So this compound is present at low concentrations in the natural bryozoans, that CMOS I mentioned. Uh, so you need approximately one metric ton of the wet material to extract just one gram of bryostatin one. So this is um, like harvesting it is ecologically problematic. Um, uh, so it's essentially like condensing down, you know, the mass of three elephants into a salt shaker. Um, and it's also very expensive to extract. So the National Cancer Institute spent over $10 million to produce just 18 grams of biostatin-1 for those clinical trials I mentioned. And Merck, who is a, a corporate collaborator with um, uh, one of our, our previous grants, estimated it would cost about $1.5 million just to uh, supply sufficient biostatin-1 for uh, non-human primate HIV latency studies. 
And so uh, some of the first work we did in collaboration with uh, the Wender Lab was an iterative process of design synthesis and testing of bryostatin analogs, uh, so design synthetic versions of bryostatin 1, uh, that could activate HIV from latency more effectively than the natural products. And this yielded compounds that could be synthesized for several thousand dollars per gram instead of the half million dollars per gram required for extraction. And they could be more importantly modified according to need, so essentially tuned for performance. And so to give you an example of some of the, the simple assays that we do uh, for initial screening of compounds, uh, we have cell lines that harbor integrated copies of HIV that are, are latently infected, they're not expressing, but they encode GFP. And if you stimulate those cells to uh, produce virus, uh, then they become GFP positive. So this is a nice, easy assay. And so at the bottom here, I'm just showing some examples. So the x-axis shows ascending concentrations of compound, and the y-axis shows um, the HIV latency reversal. And we have prostratin in green, bryostatin one in black, and some of the synthetic bryostatin analogs in red. So you can see in some cases, we have um, the synthetic analogs work to lower concentrations and could induce HIV from latency more effectively than the natural product. We uh, conducted a, an analogous series of experiments with uh, prostratin. Um, and uh, so we used a slightly different assay here where you add the latency reversing agent, uh, you wait 48 hours, and then uh, we essentially harvested the supernatant, which contained virus produced by the lately infected cells, and then quantified HIV P24 in the supernatant. Uh, so this is one of the core protein of HIV. And data is shown below where we have uh, prostratin in green and one of the synthetic prostratin analogs in red. So uh, this particular analog could function at concentrations over a thousand fold lower than prostratin and could induce uh, HIV from latency much more effectively. And so then we conducted uh, you know, a, a series of experiments. We tested over a hundred different design synthesized PKC modulators uh, in a suite of assays. Um, so uh, some of the data is uh, summarized in, in the papers at the bottom or shown here, where we looked at HIV latency reactivation. And for our preferred molecules, we looked at a variety of other things, including activation marker upregulation, what they do to HIV spread or HIV replication, uh, what they do to HIV entry receptors, um, whether they induce cytokine, uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we broadly think would be a bad thing. You know, we don't want to kick up a lot of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines with these molecules. And then their effects on other HIV infected, infected cell types, including macrophages. And essentially based on these assays, we, we selected some of our, our preferred molecules uh, for further testing. And so one of our preferred molecules was a, a bryostatin analog called SUW133, um, shown on the right here. And the first thing we did was um, evaluate whether this would work in, uh, at reversing latency uh, in, in patient-derived cells, so actual latently infected cells, from HIV infected individuals. So these are, are people who are infected with HIV, who are treated with antiretroviral therapy and have um, undetectable plasma viral loads where the CD4 cells are extracted and um, isolated and then, and then uh, exposed to the latency reversing agent. And we add um, anti-HIV uh, drugs, so antiretroviral therapy here to stop any replication. Um, so you're only looking at virus that's directly produced from the latently infected cells. And so uh, here's some data where we uh, exposed only uh, either to media control or SCW133, and each line represents um, CD4 cells from a, a different donor. And so in all cases, we had an upregulation of HIV expression, ex vivo. And then we compared uh, SCW133 with other latency reversing agents or other stimuli. Um, and so we found that it induced about a third of the amount of virus um, that you get when you co-stimulate CD4 positive T cells with anti-CD3, CD28 co-stimulation. But uh, SUW133 uh, outperformed bryostatin JQ1, which is a BET bromo domain inhibitor, and panobinostat, barinostat, which are both um, histone deacetylase inhibitors. So the, these are, molecules are also being explored by the field for latency reversal. So it looks like in the, in the big picture, um, you know, SUW133 worked pretty well compared with other latency reversing agents. And one of, the, one of the things we noticed early on with all these PKC modulators is um, that they induce expression of the early T cell activation markers, CD69. Uh, and they do so at concentrations that are similar to those required to induce HIV from latency. So this gray square on the right-hand plot, that is SUW133. So that was one of the reasons it was our, one of our preferred molecules. It works at very low concentrations. And um, so we realized that we could use this, this uh, CD69 as a biomarker 
to see whether um, bioactive concentrations of compound were getting um, like into tissues and activating cells in vivo. And so we wanted to, uh, to do some in vivo testing. At this point, we had no idea if um, th these new compounds would be tolerated at all in vivo, if they would be bioactive at all. And so uh, we did some studies in immunocompetent mice. Um, so these are C57 black six mice, just regular um, like mouse immune system. And we looked for um, acute toxicity after 24 hours to see if they were tolerated after IP injection. Uh, we looked at cytokine induction, um, CD69 upregulation, and also the tissue distribution of activated cells um, to get an idea of what these compounds would do in vivo. And so we essentially boiled down a lot of that data into two key parameters, um, so, which are shown here. So in red, we're looking at the percentage of CD4 positive T cells in spleen that are expressing CD69. So this is the biomarker we're interested in inducing that we want to induce. And then in blue, we have the toxicity. So essentially whether the mice got sick in 24 hours and had to be uh, sacrificed, um, or if they died in the course of, of the, um, the follow-up. And so this is the results with bryostatin-1, so which is that natural product that's been in over 40 clinical trials in humans. And you can see that there's a very narrow window um, which, where you have bioactivity before toxicity kicks in with this natural product, between about 2.5 and 5 micrograms per animal. Contrast that with SUW133, uh, where we had bioactivity as low as one microgram per mouse, and we had some mice surviving up to 20 or 30 micrograms per animal. Um, so this was another reason this was one of our preferred molecules. Um, so not perfect, uh, but better as a lead compound than the natural product. Uh, we find that this activation is transient, so uh, it goes almost down to baseline by day nine post-stimulation. Uh, which is really what we want. We don't want to induce um, you know, long-term immune activation with these types of therapies. And we kind of envisage that it's unlikely that a single dose of an LRA will, will deplete all the reservoir. More likely, we would have to do repeated dosing. And so this pulse of activation is you know, compatible with that type of approach. Um, and then we looked at a range of other markers. Um, just an example here is uh, CD25. Can I ask a, a question? Oh, of course, yes, yeah. Um, so what's killing the mice? What how does that toxicity work in? That's pretty dramatic. You go from day yeah. four, you're down to uh, you're uh -huh. down 100% to uh, zero. Yeah, exactly. So um, it looks like it's platelet aggregation is actually the, um, so yeah, it appears it's vascular leakage, you know, morphologically. And so at the high doses of the compounds, you have um, evidence of, you know, uh, leakage into the gastrointestinal tract, leakage into the lungs, the, the uh, thoracic cavity. Um, but it seems like the, the actual mechanism is uh, platelet aggregation, uh, most likely at the high doses. I'm not sure how many people you're going to have uh, lining up to take this. At the, you were certainly not the bryostatin one of those doses. Indeed, yes. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, for CD25, there was um, limited CD25 upregulation. And, um, and uh, so this is a, a component of the interleukin-2 receptor. Um, so IL-2 is required for efficient T cell proliferation. Um, and this is consistent with what we've seen previously in in vitro studies where um, stimulation of the PKC pathway leads to early T cell activation marker expression, but it doesn't lead to uh, later T cell activation marker expression like um, uh, HLADR or CD25, and it doesn't induce T cell proliferation. Um, so that was all in, in regular immunocompetent mice. Um, in, uh, if you want to study HIV replication or pathogenesis um, or reservoir formation, then um, you need to use other model systems. And this is because HIV only infects humans and closely related non-human primates. Uh, and so if you want to study HIV in vivo, one can use uh, non-human primates infected with a related virus, a simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. Uh, or you can use a chimera of HIV and SIV. Um, or you can use humanized mice uh, to uh, infect with HIV. And so the type of humanized mice that we use uh, are, um, uh, they're essentially they can be thought of as being immunodeficient mice where we put in the human immune system. So you transplant them with the human immune system. And uh, so these are powerful tools for studying various different human specific interactions, including uh, you know, immune uh, system development, gene therapy approaches that, that are specific for, um, for human genes, human-specific viral infections, uh, recombinant T-cell receptors that, that require um, you know, human um, uh, protein expression. And, um, and so in the context of HIV, uh, there's various different 
methods for humanization. So uh, one of the most advanced is a so-called BLT or bone marrow liver thymus model. And uh, so this has been, been used for various different advances, including uh, understanding HIV origins and the cellular uh, tissue tropism of viruses, uh, efficacy, testing efficacy of antiretroviral drugs and other therapeutics, looking at innate immune responses, um, and then studying HIV persistence and, uh, and latency. And so the way that this BLT model is constructed, uh, it is uh, essentially, this was developed using um, original work by Mike McCune at, uh, at Stanford and then built on by Victor Garcia's lab at UNC. Uh, so you take fetal human thymus and liver tissue and implant it under the kidney capsule of an immunodeficient mouse. And there it forms uh, an organoid that's structurally and functionally similar to human thymus. So this is where T cells are born. Uh, we then need to make space in the bone marrow. So we do that with preconditioning, with radiation or basophen treatment, and then transfuse in CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. And there you have formation of, of a, a near complete human immune system. So it's not perfect, but you do have uh, human T cells and B cells, monocyte macrophages, uh, natural killer cells, dendritic cells that are present and uh, distributed through multiple organs in the, uh, in the mouse. Um, and importantly, we showed uh, some years ago that you can take this, this model, infect it with HIV, uh, treat with FDA-approved antiretroviral drugs, and you have formation of a latent reservoir. So this can be used for studying um, HIV persistence and uh, cure approaches. And so one of the first things we did was um, to see whether uh, our you know, test compounds could upregulate uh, that biomarker we're interested in, CD69, in uh, human cells in vivo. Previously, we had looked in, in murine cells. And we found that, um, that there was robust um, upregulation in the blood of CD69 with limited CD25 upregulation. And similarly in the spleen, we had robust uh, CD69 upregulation with uh, limited CD25. Uh, so it's bioactive um, in human cells in an in vivo environment. Uh, so at that point, we wanted to start uh, looking at the effects on HIV in vivo. And so for that, we used a, a reporter virus. Um, and uh, so for any HIV aficionados in the audience, this is an NO4-3 based virus. It's an X4-tropic strain um, and it's near full length, um, but it does have an HA tag in place of VPR. So uh, this, is, uh, this HA tag is a, a short peptide derived from uh, hemagglutinin that's expressed on the cell surface of productively infected cells. Um, so this is useful for latency studies because if you have a, um, if you have a, a latently infected cell, then it's HA negative. And if you stimulate that to produce uh, HIV proteins, it becomes HA positive. And there's various other benefits for using this in, in our uh, humanized mouse models. And so this is the schematic of the, uh, the um, infection, the experiment. So first we transplant the uh, animals to reconstitute the human immune system. Uh, we then uh, infect with this NLHA virus. Um, we treat with antiretroviral therapy. And so uh, here we're um, using therapy consisting of TDF, FTC, and raltegravir. Uh, which is a common regimen uh, that's used in HIV-infected patients. Um, once viral loads are suppressed, we essentially wanted to get a before and after um, analysis, um, so to see whether we're, we can, we're increasing HIV expression. So we bled the mice, and then while maintaining antiretroviral therapy, we um, injected the SUW133 and then sacrificed the mice the next day. And so here's some example data where each row is um, cells derived from a different mouse pre or post stimulation. Um, and then the y axis is the um, cells that are actively expressing HIV, and the x axis is the human CD45, so human immune cells. And so what we found was there was uh, you know, a small but quantifiable increase in the frequency of HA positive cells, those cells actively expressing HIV. And that's shown here in the peripheral blood and also in the spleen. Um, so another thing that we wanted to establish was um, what happens to those cells? You know, is a strong kick in vivo enough to induce expression of HIV from latency and then uh, lead to death of the host cell, either through viral cytopathic effects or an endogenous immune response? Or do we need to come in with a separate kill arm? So for example, cytotoxic T lymphocytes or immunotoxins, something to accelerate the killing of the, the cells we have just you know, woken up from latency. And so what we found was uh, using a vital dye where we looked at cells actively expressing uh, HIV versus those that, that do not, was that between five and 25% of the cells that have been induced to express HIV are dead or dying. And that was true with both growth red and zombie yellow. And so it looks like at least a fraction of the reservoir is killed just by providing a strong in vivo kick or induction. 
Uh, we also have been um, exploring ways to potentially improve this effect um, and maybe like reduce the doses even more using synergistic combinations of compounds. And so uh, it's been understood that certain combinations of a natural PKC modulator and a histone deacetylase inhibitor can be synergistic. Um, and the idea is that the histone deacetylase inhibitors kind of unwind the chromosomal DNA and that allows access to the NF-kappa B that's induced by the PKC modulator. But it was not known if that's a general feature of these different pathways or if it's specific to the individual compounds being tested. So to explore that, we did some latency reversal assays using um, seven different PKC modulators that are structurally diverse, as shown here with the SUW numbers, um, and then various different histone deacetylase inhibitors. And we found that in all cases, when you add a suboptimal concentration of, of either PKC modulator or histone deacetylase uh, HTAC inhibitor, uh, or a combination of the two, we found that the combination um, like was um, synergistic, uh, synergistically activated. Um, and that was true with antinostat, borinostat, and panobinostat uh, with all these different PKC modulators. So it does seem to be a general feature of these pathways. Uh, we looked at other activities, including, um, so these compounds can also downregulate HIV entry receptors, um, including CD4, CXCR4, and CCR5, um, but they, they have no effect on CD45 expression in human PDMC, as shown here. Um, and they can inhibit HIV spread in culture. So they're, they're, on the one hand, turning on latent virus, but on the other hand, they can um, uh, reduce HIV spread um, in both X4, as shown with NO4-3 here, and R5 tropic strains of HIV with NFNSX. So this kind of leads us to uh, you know, a model where these PKC modulators have various different effects on HIV. So they can wake up the latent virus, uh, they can synergize with different histone deacetylase inhibitors to more effectively um, you know, induce expression. Uh, they inhibit HIV replication in culture. Uh, reduce HIV entry receptor levels. Um, and then I didn't show the data here, but they can also reduce lower levels of um, pro-inflammatory cytokines than uh, the natural products, uh, which is, um, they, although they do still induce some pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so, so that's modification of these red portions of the molecules, making analogs and seeing if the, you can enhance activity. Um, so again, in collaboration with our, our uh, chemistry colleagues at Stanford, um, We've also been exploring whether one can modify these lower portions, the blue portions of the molecules, um, to essentially make prodrugs. Um, and so the rationale behind this, this is that, you know, bryostatin one used in clinical trials is often administered by low intravenous continuous infusion over hours or days to avoid toxicities associated with bolus injection. And so developing inactive bryostatin conjugates that, that gradually release the free bryostatin over time may reduce these bolus effects, reduce administration times and control uh, biodistribution and bioavailability. So in short, if you, rather than injecting 100% active compound, if you instead can inject an inactive compound that, that becomes biodistributed and slowly becomes active over time, then it might be better tolerated and more efficacious. And so to explore that, I mentioned that PKC has to bind to these three different oxygens um, in order to, um, to activate downstream signaling pathways. Uh, but if you occlude one of these oxygens with a chemical group, this stops that binding from happening. But if that chemical group is cleavable by, uh, by um, things that are present in, in vivo, like esterases present in serum and tissues, um, which is what we used, then it slowly becomes degraded and hydrolyzed over time. And then you have a release of the active compound, which can bind to PKC and mediate the downstream effects. Um, so we, uh, we tested various different um, prodrug versions of uh, both bryostatin, uh, cristratin, and also a related PKC modulator, uh, Ingenol. Um, here's just a little bit of, uh, of data showing this, uh, where initially we, we, um, we determined whether we actually do see a delay in activity with um, addition of these different R groups. And uh, so here, bryostatin-1 induces CD69 expression very rapidly in primary human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, um, whereas two of the uh, prodrugs, uh, like 8C and 8D here, have a delayed activity. Um, so we found the, there's also a delay in uh, latently infected cells, like cell lines in vitro. Um, and then we also tested them ex vivo in patient-derived cells, again, to see how they compare with, um, uh, with maximal T cell activation. Um, and we actually found that the prodrug 8D worked as well as co-stimulation um, at, at inducing HIV from latency. So each of these symbols represents cells from a different HIV infected donor. Um, so it works um, like it's very efficacious as compared with the anti-CD3, CD28 uh, co-stimulation. 
Uh, so again, we wanted to, um, to look in vivo and see if, um, if the mechanism of action was as we uh, predicted. Are they better tolerated? Are they, um, are they still bioactive? And so we injected either Ryostatin-1 as before or one of the prodrugs uh, into C57 black six mice. And again, looked at their acute toxicity and um, their bioactivity in splenic CD4 positive T cells. Um, and so shown on the right, on the left is uh, Bryostatin 1. And there's an inset with a kind of zoomed in X axis. And so this is similar to the data that I showed you before. There's this very narrow window where Bryostatin 1 is functional before you get toxicity kicking in. Um, whereas we, we had uh, more functionality with the, um, the prodrugs, compounds 8C and 8D, uh, where nearly 100% of the um, CD4 positive splenocytes had been induced to um, express CD69. Um, and they were also much better tolerated over a wide range of doses. Um, so that Bryostatin 1, you have that really steep drop off, the toxicity that Eric just mentioned. Um, whereas with a prodrug approach, you have a much broader window uh, where they're active, but not toxic. Um, and so uh, beyond that, we've been exploring other different pathways. So I mentioned these PKC modulators. This is one potential pathway uh, that can synergize with histone deacetylase inhibitors. Um, but uh, we've also been exploring um, other cellular pathways that can lead to HIV latency reversal. And so one pathway that induces fewer um, genes to be upper down regulated than the PKC pathway is a so-called non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway. And um, so our, uh, our colleagues and collaborators at Sanford Burham, so the Sumit Chandra's lab, um, a few years ago um, showed that this non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway can be used to um, induce HIV from latency in vitro uh, using compounds that are called SMAC mimetics. And, uh, but it was unknown whether they would have any functionality in vivo. So we've been collaborating to test these in vivo and see if they do anything to latent HIV. Um, so our, our experiments involve uh, constructing humanized BLT mice, as I mentioned before, uh, allowing reconstitution over eight weeks of that human immune system, uh, performing HIV infection, um, uh, treating with antiretroviral therapy to suppress the virus and, and kind of emulate the situation that occurs in infected patients. Um, and then here, uh, two days before, um, before sacrifice, we uh, introduced either a control, like a vehicle control, or this latency reversing agent, this non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway activator, uh, SMAC mimetic. And then we were essentially looking, can we, did we see any evidence of turning on uh, the latent HIV reservoir? So here's what the data look like. Uh, panel A shows the vehicle control treated animals. So they're infected, suppressed with antiretroviral therapy, and the vehicle control did nothing to um, HIV expression. Um, panel B shows uh, the animals that were treated with different doses of the SMAC mimetic. And so uh, there's a blowout in panel C where three of the mice actually showed an increase in HIV RNA and plasma. So not only did we get um, HIV RNA expression, but there was enough expression to actually uh, you know, see it uh, when we did uh, viral load assays in the animals. Um, so this was also shown when we looked in the tissues. Um, so this is bone marrow HIV RNA expression levels. Um, so very low background with vehicle control, and we can induce um, expression with this magnetic, this uh, ciapavir. Um, so what this tells us is that, you know, this non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway is potentially exploitable um, as an in vivo method to um, reverse HIV from latency. And so in, in kind of related studies, we, we've been trying to uh, make these models more quantitative. Um, and so everything that I showed you thus far involves um, essentially uh, using clonal virus, so genetically identical viruses to perform the infections. And that's how most people do these experiments, both in vitro and in vivo. Um, but we reasoned that, you know, rather than using a genetically identical virus, if we could use a genetically diverse virus to um, infect the cells or animals, then we would generate a diverse reservoir. And so um, that would be able to uh, allow us to use sequencing information uh, of the virions uh, to tell something about their origins. So, for example, we could look at the diversity of underlying proviral DNA in the reservoir. Um, and then in response to uh, latency reversal agents or so stimulation of the reservoir, uh, we could see what fraction of cells have been induced to um, express cell-associated HIV RNA, and in turn, what fraction of those um, cells uh, produce um, whole virions. And this could obviously also be used to look at reservoir depletion. So if you kill some of these cells that harbor unique genetic variants, um, then you will have a reduction in the underlying reservoir diversity and a, a corresponding reduction in um, any virus that's produced by that reservoir. So in order to, uh, to explore this idea, uh, we've been collaborating with Ren Sun's lab at UCLA, 
And so here we're using the same reporter virus that I mentioned before, the NLHA virus, um, but we've inserted a random series of 21 nucleotides upstream of the HA tag. So this is uh, a, a, um, a non-expressed region. And um, essentially we generate a library of over, of over uh, 20,000 unique barcoded plasmids, which were used to generate uh, virions uh, by transfection into two and three FT cells. Uh, we showed that the resultant virions um, had similar genetic diversity to the input plasmids, that the virus replicates like wild type, um, and uh, that the HA reporter is maintained. So the upstream barcode didn't disrupt the expression of the reporter gene. And then we took the virus and we bulk infected human uh, co-stimulated peripheral blood mononuclear cells to let the virus replicate uh, for a few days, and then uh, sequenced what uh, came out in terms of the virus produced by these cells. And we didn't see any um, evidence of selection for or against any particular variants, which is what we want. We don't want selection occurring for particular barcodes. Uh, we want this to be phenotypically neutral. And then in terms of what, what we want to use this barcoded approach for, um, so one kind of outstanding question in the field, the only reason we care about these reservoirs at all is because they, they can seed rebound. So if you, talk, if you stop taking therapy, the virus comes right back out of these reservoirs and replicates to a high level. And so I mentioned uh, previously during uh, acute infection, you have a high level of virus replication. Um, so you have um, you know, viral loads up to tens or hundreds of thousands of copies of HIV RNA per, per mill of plasma. Um, if you initiate antiretroviral therapy, then they are brought down to often undetectable levels with standard clinical assays. So below about you know, 30 or 40 copies of HIV RNA per mill of plasma. Um, then you have an extended suppression of virus, but it doesn't matter. It, it can be um, suppressed for 10 years. If you stop taking that therapy, the virus reemerges typically within two or three weeks um, and replicates to high levels again. So this process is called a rebound. And so we want to model this process and model efforts at eliminating the reservoir using our humanized mouse. And so the idea here is that we take a barcoded HIV swarm, infect the humanized mice, and then we have uh, a lot of virus replication. So you have a lot of virions, you have a lot of virus producing cells, and you also have formation of a latent reservoir. And then when you treat the animals with antiretroviral therapy, you, um, you lose the productively infected cells, they're killed, and you're left with these latently infected cells that are not expressing. And then if we use uh, one of our latency reversing agents or, or a different latency depleting therapy, um, the idea is that we hopefully will induce some expression of the latent reservoir and eliminate some of those, uh, those latently infected cells or some of the clones. Uh, and what that means, if we, if we eliminate enough of those cells, we may delay or prevent rebound altogether. Uh, but if we have a diverse reservoir, uh, even if we eliminate only some of the clones that would have contributed to rebound, like this red clone shown here, then we may see a reduction in the genetic diversity of the rebounding virus. Um, so that's the kind of rationale for the experiment. And this is what the actual data look like, where we've infected uh, humanized NSG BLT mice with this barcoded HIV swarm. We've treated uh, with antiretroviral therapy until, um, until the, the virus is suppressed and we have undetectable plasma virus levels. We added a, a latency reversing agent. So this is that same LRA I talked about earlier, the SUW133. So we previously showed, um, as I mentioned, that, that some of the reservoir cells will die after in vivo stimulation with this LRA, um, but whether that has any significant biological consequences, the most important of which is their effects on rebound, we did not know. And so, um, so hence we, uh, we use the same LRA and instead of um, sacrificing the animals on ART, we stop the therapy and allow rebound to occur. And so we did find that the, with the SUW133 treated animals, uh, there was a delay in rebound. Um, so four of the 15 treated animals did not rebound in the, in the uh, one month follow-up period. And we also found that there was a reduction in the uh, barcoded HIV uh, diversity in the rebounding virus in both plasma and spleen, um, indicating that some of the clones that, that would have um, seeded rebound had been eliminated by the, uh, the therapy. So I will note that obviously we didn't prevent rebound in all the animals. Um, and so, you know, part of the, the ongoing work that we have is to combine uh, this um, latency reversing agent, this waking up of latent virus with uh, a kill arm, whether that's natural killer cells or cytotoxic T lymphocytes uh, to try and enhance the reservoir depletion uh, during ART and, um, and prevent rebound. And so um, with that, a uh, few conclusions. So I showed that PKC modulators can be modified in, in various different ways uh, to improve HIV latency reversal and in vivo tolerability. Um, so either through enhanced delivery methods, uh, through the use of analogs, 
or through their use of prodrugs. Um, so uh, the natural products are, are pretty toxic at the doses that uh, are required to reverse HIV from latency, but this can be enhanced uh, or improved upon. Uh, and then alternative pathways for latency reversal include um, combination with uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors uh, and the use of uh, non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway activators like SMAC memetics. Um, and then HIV latency reversal in vivo uh, during ART results in viral reservoir reductions. So we saw that latently infected cells die in response to this uh, latency reversal in vivo. Uh, this can lead to uh, some delay in rebound um, and the reduction in the diversity of barcoded HIV. So indicating that some of the clones that would have seeded rebound are eliminated. Um, and so uh, it's a pleasure to have arrived at, uh, at UCI. Um, and so I'm going to continue with uh, the same vein of work, the same core model systems, uh, but uh, we have a few different experimental questions we're interested in. Uh, so one is uh, continuing studies related to HIV rebound and latency reversing agents, understanding what induces rebound under normal circumstances and uh, better methods for eliminating reservoirs that maintain infection. Um, I also have a collaboration with Elaine Shaw's lab at UCLA um, to study HIV microbiome interactions. Um, so we've um, so, you know, long understood that, uh, that the gut microbiota can affect immune cell activation states um, and that this may affect HIV transmission or replication or pathogenesis or reservoir formation, but there isn't really a small animal model for studying this in a, quanti in a quantitative way. And so, um, so we have a collaboration to, um, uh, to do exactly that, to, compare, to look at effects of the gut microbiota on HIV, like dysbiotic conditions, and also how HIV replication and CD4 depletion affects the composition of the, the gut microbiota. Um, and then I spent a lot of time today talking about uh, T cells, CD4 positive T cells, but HIV also infects other cell types, including macrophages in vivo. And so while we um, understand that HIV can form latency in CD4 positive T cells, Remarkably, it's not known whether HIV can form latency in macrophages. Um, and it's also unknown uh, whether these macrophage lineage cells um, are important in maintaining the infection during antiretroviral therapy. It's long been suspected that they might be. Uh, for example, in the brain, there's a, a, you know, a large number of infected cells, uh, HIV-infected macrophage cells or macrophage lineage cells, but we don't know if they can you know, reseed infection if ART is stopped or, or maintain the infection over long periods of time. And so these are some of the, the ongoing projects that I'm working on um, at arrival at UCI. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the projects, uh, including uh, my former mentor at UCLA, Jerry Zack, um, Ren Sun, who, uh, did the, uh, who uh, has been collaborating with the Barcoded HIV project, Elaine Shah with the uh, Gut Microbiota Project, and Lenny Rome with the Vault Studies, um, and uh, Tewik Chun at NIH helped with the, um, the ex vivo analysis of patient samples. Um, and then all the bioorganic chemistry uh, was done by Paul Wender in his uh, lab uh, at Stanford, very talented graduate students and postdocs. Um, and then collaboration with um, Sumit Chanda and Lars Pash at uh, Sanford Borough on the SMAG memetic studies. And thanks to all the funding uh, organizations as well. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Hi, hi, Matt. I have a, a quick question for you. Uh, first hi. of all, that was uh, that was amazing. It's really um, welcome to UCI. Really, well, thank you. Yes, uh, I look forward to meeting everyone in person yeah. rather than on Zoom. <laughs> uh, really cool to see those models. I mean, to be able to look at you know all these responses in the mouse model is is very cool. Uh, I was wondering in your approaches if um, when you are trying to target these latent latency infected CD4 T cells what your thoughts were in terms of these other reservoirs. So the follicular dendritic cells, for example, that can hold on to these infectious particles. So if your approach is to try to eliminate those reservoirs, can then you, you know, once you do that, can then you just restart the infection all over again if you now have these reservoirs? So are there approaches to target those cells, for example? Yeah, yeah, so that's an excellent question. And so the, the role of the FTC network in maintaining infection is a little unknown. It's a little controversial how much virus is in there, how long it can survive or persist. So Matt, the, yeah. can you stop sharing, please, so that we can see you? Oh, of course, yes, I will, sorry. Uh, Thank you. Is that better? Much better. 
Yes, okay. So, um, yeah, so this FTC network is responsible. Essentially, these dendritic cells can hang on to virions and then maybe a few months later pass them on to very efficiently to a CD4 positive T cell and reseed the infection. And so the broad model is that, you know, there are um, shorter term reservoirs, things like the FTC network, uh, maybe sort of shorter lived um, activated CD4 cells, for example. Um, and so there's several phases of decline when you start antiretroviral therapy. And it's thought that the very long-term reservoirs, for sure, lately infected CD4 cells are one of the very long-term reservoirs that can maintain infection over, you know, a, a decade, you know, because you can take those cells out and find infectious virus in them. Uh, other things like the FTC network is, is less well known how long they can, um, that they can um, hold on to virus um, in an infectious form. But one issue is uh, a lot of these clinical trials around um, you know, HIV uh, cure approaches, one of the readouts is stop ART, you know, stop therapy and see what happens and let the virus come back out. And uh, so that's part of why we're studying rebound is because there's a concern that you're going to load up all the FTC networks again. You're going to expand your reservoir again, even if it was contracting slowly over time. And so, um, so you know, it's, it's not without risk to do these um, treatment interruptions to see whether your therapy has done anything. And that was a big issue with um, children, for example, who were treated very early after birth. Um, so they were HIV infected uh, babies. They were treated with aggressive therapy after birth. And everyone had this question of how do we, I mean, can we ethically take these babies off antiretroviral therapy to see what happens? Because you may expand the reservoir, you may cause all sorts of immune damage. And so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about like, how do you know if they're cured? Um, right. so, yeah, great question. Yeah. Right, no, that's a, that's a big deal, uh, taking them off the retroviral therapy. So hold on, Ilham, uh, we have one question before you. She's so exciting. Um, question from Jesse Kreger, and I would say anyone just uh, either show yourselves, uh, wave your hands, or type something into the chat. Uh, but from Jesse, do you want to ask directly, Jesse, or you want to read it? Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> right, thanks for a great talk. She says, Jesse, what is the role of cell to cell transmission and multiple infection on latency and on rebound? Uh, yeah, so there's definitely cell to cell transmission with HIV. It's much more effective and efficient than um, like transmission through free virus particles if you have cells very close together. Um, in terms of, and, the, and cells can be multiply infected, you know, so HIV, like most viruses or many viruses, can downregulate its own entry receptors to stop the cell from, you know, immediately recapturing any virions produced. And so HIV downregulates CD4, for example. Uh, which kind of reduces the frequency of multiply infected cells. But if you look, for example, in spleen, you see evidence of cells that have, you know, like six or seven different proviruses. And so you can have multiply infected cells. Um, and so in terms of their role in, uh, you know, rebound or latency, um, it's not thought that a multiply infected cell is any more likely to become latent. You know, one may argue it's less likely if there's any integration site you know, um, a specificity for, uh, or more likelihood in some integration sites for the virus to become latent. If you have seven proviruses, then it's less likely they will all become latent. But beyond that, there's, it's not thought that, um, uh, that that's important. Um, for rebound, for sure, you need both uh, reactivation of a latently infected cell, and you need adjacent cells um, to infect. You know, you have to seed this, this uh, exponential spread of virus to stimulate rebound. So cell-cell spread may be important there. Right, great question. Um, Ilhan. Thanks, Eric. Matt, very nice talk, as usual. Um, and I, so I have a couple questions, and I, I'm sorry if, I think you addressed them when you actually interviewed here, but <laughs> what about reservoir in things like the microglia or the CNS? Like, what, what happens to those reservoirs, and have you looked at drug penetrance into those um, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And um, so the, the main um, like place that they, or anatomical site that HIV replicates outside the peripheral blood and lymphoid system is the central nervous system. Um, and so and the main uh, infected cell types are parenchymal microglial cells and also perivascular macrophages. Um, and the role of that in persistence during therapy is unknown. It's a little controversial. Um, and it may be, uh, there may be a few things going on. One is that some of the antiretroviral drugs don't have good CNS penetration. For example, some of the protease inhibitors 
So you may have a situation where you don't have ideal suppression of virus. Um, and then uh, there's definitely a reduction in uh, the amount of virus present in the CNS during um, an infected cells, like during ART. Uh, but it's it's hard to get samples. You know, this is why we need animal models to to really study what's going on. Uh, it's easy to get blood, so we can look at you know CD4 cell latency. It's hard to get tissue samples to look at, at macrophages and microglial cells. Um, so yeah, the answer is we don't know. We don't know if they can be lately infected. We don't know if the brain can serve as a long-term reservoir. So I'm interested in studying each of those questions. As a follow-up, and the reason why I asked that question is because. So in the mice, um, bryostatins and you know, these drugs that get immune activation, the mm -hmm. mice do die quickly and they die from these, some of these other complications of platelet activation. But I think in, in humans, you may see a very different phenotype with more of like a cytokine storm that may change the, the blood brain barriers. So all of a sudden these unknown, you know, reservoirs of unknown importance, mm -hmm. <laughs> such as the CNS um, may become more relevant in situations where like vascular permeability is changed and, and altered. So anyway, it's just something that I was curious yeah, about. Yeah, for sure. That's a big area of interest. The NIH is very interested in, in delivery of both antiretrovirals and also, you know, these latency reversing agents into the CNS to try and get it across the blood-brain barrier more effectively. Um, yeah. I mean, I think your last key, your last uh, point there was, was a major one. Um, Matt, and that is, you know, the only way you know if these things are going to actually are effective in, in curing is to take them off the heart therapy. And uh, that, I mean, that you said it's risky in kids. I would think it's risky in anyone. Yeah, so the, the, there's a certain amount of um, not, not a serious controversy because people monitor, you know, it, where the threshold should be, you know, how much, how much activation should you allow? Because some, some people mm -hmm. might say, if you, if you see any virus popping up after stopping therapy, that should be enough. It tells you, hey, we still have a reservoir there, um, we should stop. But if you're doing, so, for example, trying to augment the anti-HIV immune response with a vaccine, then you may not delay rebound, but you may blunt it so you get a lower viral set point than you had before. Um, and so if that's the outcome, you have to wait and see if you have a lower viral set point. And so, um, yeah, there is monitoring uh, that, that's, uh, you know, safety monitoring for the, these kind of uh, studies, but it's, it's not straightforward, you know, uh, and partly because the drugs are really good. And so anything mm -hmm. that you're going to do to, um, you know, you ha there has to be adequate justification for taking someone who's like happy and healthy on antiretroviral therapy off. Um, so, right, yeah. right. So there is a push though from the NIH to do this. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's all, I mean, yeah, uh, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, we, we need a cure for HIV, you know, yeah. we need to stop transmission, we need to stop the ongoing yeah. problems with, um, uh, you know, virus replication and expanse and yeah. So, How do the manufacturers of the heart drugs feel about that? Yeah, so, well, I mean, they're pushing. <laughs> they probably are not happy about it. Big collaboratories, like NIH. Collaboratories, Is it really? Um, yeah, they have to have a corporate partner. And so the, all the big ones, you know, Merck and Gilead um, are, uh, you know, involved as corporate partners. So I think that, you know, they, you know, are, want to see a cure for HIV as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they have obviously large drug libraries that they can bring to bear. But, uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a very, um, you know, challenging problem. Uh, so. Right, right. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Are there any other questions? In which case I will say um, thank you again for a great talk, really interesting. And uh, welcome to UCI. And someday, you know, we all hope to be able to see you in person. I know. I but at least we know you exist and what you do, uh, know what you do. So that's great. Um, all right. Thanks, for, thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch about uh, next future events uh, for this.